Hello. Hello, my loves. Hi, Cheryl. Hello and Merry Christmas. Yes, Merry Christmas. Hi, Robin. Hello from California, my uh, previous um, stomping ground. Um, hi, Adam. So good to see you on here. Hope you guys are doing great. I hope you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Um, I did. It was especially, hey, Monty, so good to see you on here. Um, it was especially meaningful because there's some family that has lived out of state for a long time and they're back. And so we just had this big, loud, lots of laughing kind of Thanksgiving and it was really special. Hi, Shazia. Hey, y'all. Hi, John. Good to see you from Holloway Nation. Oh, that sounds so good. I like that. Holloway Nation. Um, good to see you on here, John. Hi, Brooklyn. Hi, Jenny. So good to see you guys. I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving and um, enjoyed that the, the turkey got, if you had turkey that it got cooked all the way, which, you know, would be good. And then um, that it wasn't burned. So, you know, somewhere in between is good. We're driving home from the Michigan State basketball game. Oh, wow. Cheryl. Well, did I hate to say this, but did they win? I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm horrible. I'm a horrible sports fan. Um, uh, but I'm glad you're here. Be careful. Hi, Odessa. So good to see you. Um, it's just fun to be here again. It's officially the Christmas season, which I love. And um, the tree is up, not fully decorated yet, but it is up and the lights are on. So, um, you know, I'm getting there. I'll get there eventually. Hey, Cheryl. Yeah, Emily. Hi, Emily. Good to see you. Oh, they won. Woohoo. Cheryl, that's awesome. Great. Well, um, uh, Boise State has a big game, which is their championship game this coming Saturday, playing UNLV um, in Las Vegas. I'm not going, but um, it's kind of a big deal because they started out with a really rough season and then fired their coach halfway through the season. And um, we really didn't think they'd do anything. So anyway, that's that's what I know of sports. There you go. You're welcome. Anyway, um, okay, tonight, your tree is up, lights on to Norna. Cheryl, I am right there with you. I'm with, the lights are awesome though. It's great. Okay, so you guys, I'm going to jump right into our guests as more of you sign in and I'll just do a, a global hello to all of you. Excited you're here. Um, you guys, tonight we have comedy royalty with us, basically, and one of the absolute nicest people I have the absolute joy of knowing. And um, yeah, you guys, if you don't already know her, you will love her. Now you might know her as the mom on Good Luck Charlie. She did 98 episodes of Good Luck Charlie. So, you know, that's a lot. Um, I'm going through her extensive credits and there's a few of these I love. Um, she played Liz and was executive producer on a movie called The Bad Hair Day. I love that. We'll have to ask her about that. But you most know her from Good Luck Charlie, Jesse, um, Will and Grace. Oh my gosh, you just have so many. And then recently, I had the joy of working with her on Family Camp and Christmas in the Pines, which was a wonderful Christmas movie that we shot um, really right on the brink of COVID. So um, yeah, it was nice getting back to work. Um, she is uh, also in Into the Spotlight, which was recently released. And then she is a producer on the series, The Glitch, that um, they're working on getting out into the world. So anyway, the one and only Lee Allen Baker, so excited she's here with us tonight. So let's bring her in. And I hope you guys have lots. Hey! Hi! At first I thought you were talking about somebody else. But then I was like, oh. <laughs> it's all you. It's all Hi, you. Friend. How are you? <laughs> Good to see you. And you look all Christmassy, which is awesome. I yes, love that. I've been Christmased out since Halloween. Basically, <laughs> I don't know if you people know this. But Halloween is the first day of Christmas. Yes. 
I totally, I'm with you. It's like, uh, well, I wait until the day after Halloween and then it's officially Christmas, like full on ready to go Christmas. Nice. Yeah. Um, so you guys, we're going to, we're going to talk about a couple of things with Lee Allen. Um, but I want you to be thinking of questions for Lee specifically with regards to maybe her career acting, the specific acting in comedy, any of that. I'll be myself and Diego, who of course is behind the scenes, like the wizard lurking, of Oz. Like a yes. creepy dude. <laughs> Working like creepy dudes lurk. <laughs> Just sitting there. <laughs> Wondering what we're going to say next. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Try to, where's where's the like buzzer, right? <laughs> um so anyway so yeah put your questions um in the comments diego we'll keep an eye on them and we'll certainly uh try to cover your questions as well there he goes diego's behind the scenes <laughs> gotta love it um oh cheryl says candy season starts on halloween and ends on easter so that just encompasses all of it a lot and of dentist appointments Yes, there you go. Okay, well, my friend, you've been kind of doing a few things. Yeah, I've been <laughs> so busy. I don't know if Diego told you that I almost burned down my kitchen yesterday. Oh, how did that happen? I've been doing so many things and so many new projects, and um, some of them I can talk about, some of them I can't. I could, but then I'd have to kill you. Yes, uh, all of us. Uh, so I was so busy and so distracted doing so many things, Mach 2 with my hair on fire. And I kept hearing God say to me, slow down, woman, slow down, woman, slow down, woman. Then I turned over and looked at my kitchen. An entire pot was on fire, three feet flames, this wide, three <gasps> feet in the air. I was like, oh. Yeah. Oh um, my gosh. I had, oh my God. I was going to make popcorn for my kids. <laughs> I put coconut oil on the pan and turned it on <gasps> and then started laying into my kids and totally lost track that I was doing that. Thank goodness I didn't leave the room. I turned around and I mean, my hood could have caught fire. It was so bad. I put on oven mitts. My one son ran to grab the fire extinguisher. I moved it to the sink that at least didn't have furniture above it. And let me tell you, people, your instinct is going to be to put water on this thing, but it will explode all over you and burn you and your house if you do. So I grabbed the lid and I threw it on it and the fire immediately went out. <laughs> the whole house smelled of smoke. I had to open every door. It was 32 degrees, every door, every window, set the pot <laughs> aside. It was, it, was a, it was a crime scene. So see you all, we have already given you one very important life tip, which is do not put the coconut oil in the pan and then start laying into your kids. Yeah. And <laughs> don't put water on a grease fire. Any fire in the kitchen, don't put, don't no put water. It. You can put flour on it, a blanket over it, put the lid on it. That's all you can do. We are, see, Emily's like noted. Yes. We're just <laughs> learning all sorts of things. Um, you, you really are like a mom to millions. You're just <laughs> perpetually a mom to millions. I don't know how to get out of that mom zone. So <laughs> I've actually decided to start on my Instagram giving tips because every kid that I meet is like, you raised me. Like, well, <laughs> since I raised you, I may as well give you some tips. Like, do you know how to put a, out a grease fire? Do you know how to fold a fitted sheet properly? No, I don't. And I'm 60. <laughs> All right. Listen, we're going to learn. We're going to do okay. that. One of, one of these Tuesdays, we're going to just go full mom and learn how to fold a fitted sheet. Yes. <laughs> I love it. Um, so... First of all, you dropped some merch, which I love. I love your merchandise. I love it. Love it. It's um. so how did that come about? So I, um, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm terrible at posting because I just, I'm like, why do people want to see pictures of me or me doing things? <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> My kids don't even want me in the house half the time. So how do people <laughs> want to see this? And one day Diego texted me and was like, you know, your fans miss you. And I was like, oh, okay. So I posted something. Then I posted something else. 
then I started having conversations with people. And then one day I just thought, oh, I have this bag that my best friend Terry bought me. And I was like, showing my bag. And everyone was like, wow, I want that bag. Where'd you get that bag? It said, Jesus Family Freedom, Amy Duncan. Oh, there you go. And those are my priorities right there. Yes, there you go. So I just, Diego and I started brainstorming and thought, what if we do sweatshirts? What if we do bags? What if we try this, you know, and try to get it together for Christmas? So um, I can't use the name Amy Duncan because Disney owns that, but they don't own the yeah. word BAM because I made it up and you can't copyright a word. Um, so mine says Jesus Family Freedom BAM. And then I have another one that just says BAM. And then I have a sweatshirt that is, I come up with a lot of these quotes and little sayings and things all the time. And one of the things I came up with was, I disagree. I don't understand. I love you anyway. I love that. And on a, and that hits a more serious note, which is, I think if we could all adopt that way of thinking and dealing with each other, we'd all be better off. We'd be kinder and we'd have better friendships or at least better relationships, you know? Um, yeah. So what led you to, for that specific, there you go. We have the link up there. Her merch is available at the, sorry, the lab, original. the lab originals com. Perfect. Um, you guys, the stuff's really cute. And, and that sweatshirt specifically hit me because especially in our industry, there's a lot of people we encounter, right. Who we don't agree with and, and frankly don't understand, but important that we love them anyway. One of the reasons that I came up with that sweatshirt is because I was really shocked when the first time I was canceled, they've done it three the times. First time. it's like, go for it. <laughs> You're going to go for it again. Eventually you'll tire of this. It doesn't work. You can't erase the person's existence. So exactly, it's like not a thing. You think it's a thing. It's not a thing. But um, I was shocked that because I held a different opinion uh, that and mine was specifically towards uh, the vaccine. I didn't want to get it. I wasn't going to let my kids get it because my kids had vaccine injuries. And it's a subject that no one wants to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's a really dangerous time in history if you're not allowed to question the most corrupt industry in the world. In the history of the world. It's the most corrupt industry in the history of the world. And we're not allowed to question it or we're silenced, shunned, canceled, labeled all sorts of terrible things. And I remember thinking, gosh, this is this is crazy. Mm -hmm. you know, um, people, actors calling me, what do I do? I don't want to get it. And I don't want to do this, but I'm afraid to speak about it. And I don't want people to know that I don't want that. And I just was surprised at how afraid people were. Because mm -hmm. to yeah. me, what's more fearful than that, I mean, the horrifying situation is when the government has full authority and control over your body and can inject you at will and by demand. That's a really yes. dangerous situation. If someone wants to get it, great. Hey, they, I'm here to fight for everyone's freedom to do what they want to do, you know? Right. Not right. That by any means. But, you know, I was shocked at how vilified I was, how mm -hmm. there was no compassion for the sheer trauma that my children and I went through with their vaccine injuries and the medical situations. And that I was met with such violence, really. I got death threats. And I remember just thinking like, what does this generation not know that there was a time when, and it got very political. It came, became political. Of course. Of course. Who's president of the United States doesn't have authority over your body either anymore than, you know, the right. health guy does. Right. It comes from God. So I was just shocked at how people were so divided over this, politicized it. And then I remember thinking, gosh, I remember a time when we would go vote and like my friend and I would be like, Hey, let's go cancel each other's votes out mm -hmm. and conservative. And I was the Democrat, honestly, that's how it was. And we're like, let's go. And then we'll go afterwards and have some cocktails and salad. Like that was kind of our, that's what you did. No one hated right. each other for literally, I mean, it doesn't matter who you voted for, or who you support. If you completely ostracized another human being, because they went to a legal voting place and legally voted for a legal nominee. Like, sorry, but you're the bad guy in this. Right. Like, right. Nope. You're the bad guy. Right. 
I mean, yeah, it's, it's true. But I just wanted people to know that I can disagree with you and I can right. totally not understand where you're coming from. And you can totally disagree with me and not understand where I'm coming from. But here, let me bridge that gap for you that you're having a little bit of trouble bridging. While you want to yes. kill me, rape me, murder my children, I'm just, I want to love you. You know, I remember yes. someone said on my, um, my Twitter, um, I hope you and your ugly kids die of COVID. And I said, well, I don't hope you die. I, I hope you live and I hope you flourish and live in abundance and joy and peace because somebody's suffering does not improve or hinder my situation at all. Right. Right. You know, right. I, I hope for everybody to be free, to make the choices right. that they feel are best for them. I don't think people need big daddy government. I think that people are mature enough to be responsible and make their own decisions for themselves. Yeah. And, and I just, you know, it dawned on me, we can sit here and fight each other all day long, but that's really at the end of the day, a, a, it's really a Marxist tool used to divide nations so you can mm -hmm. instill right. it and then control people more. And right. so I thought, what if we just like, what if I just love them up? Right. I love that. Exactly. Exactly. It's true because th there is no response to that. Right. I mean, they're meaning you and then you're like, okay, well, I don't want you to die. I love you. God love you. I hope you I had one come up to me who was pretty aggressive. And I just remember looking at her saying, if you really knew me, knew my heart, you would feel really bad about what you're saying right now. Can we just start yeah. over and meet each other? And she was like, I mean, it was like, there was a glitch in her head. She was yes. like, it uh, uh, doesn't okay. compute. Yeah. I was like, Should we hug it out? You're right. <laughs> like what? Like handshake? Should we just like elbow bump, fist bump? What should we do here? Yeah. Oh, walk away. You're free to walk away. You know, that's right. it. you're totally free to disagree with me. I'm okay with that. Yeah, exactly. And it, especially because I think that um, oftentimes expressing an opinion or feeling strongly, then you get labeled as as something you're not, which is volatile or angry or argumentative it, it, and yeah. you're none of those things. So I love that that t-shirt says that because it's so counter to whatever preconceived notion someone could have. Right. Um, so I, I just think that was such a, a great and wise way to, um, sort of speak to that part. So anyway, your merch is great. Love it. Great idea. I'm glad lots of people are talking about, um, some of the pieces they've already bought that they're waiting to get. Thank and, you. Um, Victoria says your next t-shirt should be love them up. <laughs> oh, now, that's um, a great one. Thank <laughs> you. I record these things that I go around and say, because there are some gems. There are some that shouldn't be on shirts either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love it. Well, um, okay. So you have your merch line. You have a bunch of things you can't talk about. I can but... just say that one of them involves writing a book. Is that all I can say, Diego? That I'm writing something. Something else. Yay! I've done it. It's done. it's done. It's written. It's being printed. It is going to go out to everybody. I love it. We can't wait. So when when you can talk about that, you'll have to come back and and tell us all about it. Um, okay, bringing back Christmas. Yes, because it is Christmas. Great. Yes, because it's Christmas. I love. Christmas. I always <laughs> loved Christmas. The only person that I literally sat in shock with at a meal once when, was when a girl looked at me and she was like, you know, that like putting up a Christmas tree and decorating for Christmas is pagan. And I was like, <laughs> my house, I mean, meantime, like my house was totally full on deck. Yes, out. exactly. Like, Halloween. <laughs> and I just thought we need to not speak any further about this. Because what was I doing? <laughs> We're just not going to talk about this anymore. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I love it. You thought the vaccine was a polarizing subject. You yeah. had no idea Christmas was. Exactly. <laughs> that was a big awakening. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Diego says, Lee Allen book details coming soon. So uh -huh. we'll, we'll have Lee Allen. Or, I mean, we'll have Diego give us the heads up when, when yeah. you can talk about it. Um, okay. So. I'm thinking several of you have seen Bringing Back Christmas. If you haven't. That's embarrassing for you. Yeah. 
<laughs> shame on you. Shame. I'm not here to shame people, but shame on you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How can they see it? Because that's what I understand the new news is on the movie. Okay. So is there new news on the movie, Diego? 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 Just Diego? You're Fine. streaming that it's streaming. Well, it is streaming. It started streaming November 17th. It's on Amazon Prime. I think you can get it on Hulu, in demand. Um, there's lots of different places. I always just tell people, you know, the search thing, you just go to that, put in a little <laughs> bringing back Christmas. Yes. And there you go. Face my big mug will pop up with Mark Christopher Lawrence. I love it. Um, Monty watched it today. Mon Monty Halliburton Crosby. Monty Crosby watched it today. Woohoo. Um, Amazon Prime. Yeah, seems to be the best bet. So um, now that movie, what led you? You got the script. Someone said, hey, we want you to come play the angel, which, you know, can sometimes be fraught, the whole like playing an angel in a Christmas movie, you know, can fall into sort of a stereotype kind of world, you know? Yeah. So it's not that. I know, exactly. So tell me, A, what about the script drew you to it? And B, how did you decide to approach that character so well, that it wouldn't be that? Okay. So first, when I got the script, I wasn't sure that I wanted to do it because something in me felt, um, I don't know, there was a real block, uh, the way mm. that it was the birth of Jesus was treated with comedy and really casual. And I didn't like the parents talking like they talked. Oh, I, yeah. I heard, like, is it like, like sacrilegious? Like, I, I don't know. I didn't want to like be rude to Jesus, you know? Um, and then they added one line for me. They were like, what if, because I was like, why do they talk like that? <laughs> and they were like, well, it's because, you know, he can hear it. And I said, then you need to say something like that. So they had me say the line, Mark says, why do they sound like a, a sitcom? And I say, well, it's either that or you hear it in Hebrew. Oh, fun. Like he could receive it. Yes, 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 yes. So when that line got added in, I was like, all right, let's go. That that one line kind of changed the whole uh, landscape for me. Yeah, because then it becomes about putting it in language that he can receive and yes. and relate to and, and understand. That's really interesting. Now, I love just sh that you're sharing that, though, because as – um, you know, we have mostly actors on here with us. And um, I want to encourage you guys to ask those questions. If you're reading a script and um, maybe you're troubled in your soul and in your gut about something about it <coughs> doesn't quite seem right, rather than either just saying no and passing on it or doing it against that gut feeling Remember, there's a third option, which is to ask, to ask the yeah. question, right? Why, why is this being said? Voice that concern and then come up with a great solution, which that's awesome. Um, okay. are really open to that where you can really say to them, hey, this is kind of like, I'm feeling like I'm treading on dangerous territory. Or I feel like this comes across as this. They really kind of want to hear it because most writers and directors have been so immersed in the script that you really, you know, once you're in the forest, you, that that's that whole phrase. You can't see the forest for the trees. Yep. Me, once you're so immersed in it, when someone new gets a hold of it and reads it with fresh eyes, they're yeah. going to have a different take. And you, you know, most people are pretty open to that. Yeah, which is great. So remember that, you guys. Remember that option. And don't be afraid if you're getting that sense of like a gut feeling that you just need to get some clarification, do it. Absolutely. Okay, so you are playing an angel. How did you decide to approach this particular angel? Well, you know, originally they came to me to play one of the parents. And I just was not interested. I just wasn't right. interested. And I'm glad I wasn't interested because the people who played them, you know, were great. Um, I just couldn't, it wasn't enough for me to, I felt like bite into. Right. And uh, then they were like, well, what if we, I don't know that the angel was always that sassy, but I think they kind of, 
tailored her to me. And then, you know, once the camera's rolling, I'm going to bring my A game. And um, there's nothing they can do when the camera's rolling. You can go road. <laughs> I'm not advising that you do that. I'm just saying you can take that road less traveled. <laughs> And I often do because they can always say to me, oh, could you do it as written? And could you like bring it up? They can always give me direction, but I may as well. Like it's a comedy. I was, I knew my genre. I was doing right. a comedy and I wanted this, some of the scenes with Mary and Joseph, you know, they dealt with such heavy uh, things mm -hmm. that really the, our side of it, the modern day version of it really needed to be light and lightning fast. It needed to be, be yes. fast paced. Yes. It's, Knowing that, and this is one of the things I wanted to talk with you about, because understanding comedy, understanding how to deliver comedy um, is really important. And it is not easy. I would, I would say that it is more challenging. It's way more challenging than drama. I, I, I mean, it drama is. obviously is challenging, but comedy i think people think oh i can do comedy but they don't necessarily understand the timing of it you hit on something really good which is the pacing of it right comedy is often fast back and forth you can use speed you can use emphasis you can use tone you can use rhythm cadence uh sound effects head turns there's just a, a there's a just an arsenal of tools to use and it's not like i sit around and plan those no. um i kind of am funny like as a person so i'm kind of just myself when i do things right. like that and sometimes i get in this funny zone where i really surprise myself and make myself laugh because i i, I didn't plan to make that choice it was just being right. in the moment but the thing about comedy is that it's like you're not just taking a leisurely a drama is taking a leisurely stroll. Okay. Mm -hmm. You may have to go up some hills and down some hills, but comedy is like you're ice skating and you need to land the triple lutz, right? Mm -hmm. Or you on your face. Right. And the best advice that I can give people is there is nothing more serious than comedy. Nothing. You gotta be yes. Yes, yes. I, I think I've shared this before, but we have some new people probably since I said it, but I um, I worked with David Zucker, who was airplane, you know, naked gun. And he said the best comedic actors treat it like drama. Yeah. They play it. They are absolutely 100% enveloped and sold on their character. They believe that circumstances to be true and they treat it as if the stakes are life and death, that it's drama. And you can use those comedy elements in dramas. Like um, Family Camp was a comedy, but my role right. was really on the page. It was drama. There was nothing funny about my character. She was really there as a tool in the script to, you know, do the hard work of like laying pipe, telling the story, getting the story right. started. She was like a writing tool. Um, but life, no one is just dull and drama mm -hmm. all day long. No one likes smolders right. and camera all day long. So, <laughs> so yeah. I wanted to bring different levels there. I wanted to bring a personality to her. Yes. So in drama where you can have some levity, you should. And what that does is it makes people fall in love with that character. So when that character does go through hardship, your work is lighter because people care about you and they feel your pain harder. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's one of the things for those of you who are, who are hearing this and are writers, we need those comedic, genuine. Now, I understand the more over the top kinds of physical comedy and Family Camp certainly had a lot of that because that is the skit guys kind of MO, you know, that's their, mm -hmm. um, that's their lane. Um, but there were wonderful, you had wonderful opportunities to have comedy in a more grounded way as well and to bring that in. And I just think some Wait. of our stories of faith would be so much more powerful. Those, those deep moments, those powerful, intense moments would, would resonate so much stronger if we were able to bring some humanity to some of these characters and give them lightness. 
I don't know that I've ever been to a funeral where there wasn't somebody that was completely grieving and in tears that turned around and had a laugh and shared a chuckle. Yes, that's a great okay. observation. So even in the most, our most depth of grieving, people release that trauma, that sorrow with a laugh, you know? Yes. And some people do it with their nervous. Some people do it when they're hurting. Um, you know, so I think it's always important to remember that in life, no one goes around stoic faced and not having a, a lightness to them. I, when you mentioned that, I'm thinking of that scene from Steel Magnolias when Sally Field is by the graveside of her daughter and, and all the women are with her. And one minute she's just bawling, but then she's cracking a joke and they're adding a snide remark. And it's such a rich human real demonstration of yep. that process. And you as the audience, you experience that with them. Yes, yes, yes. And you're right. And we need to, if that whole scene was just Sally Field bawling and crying over her daughter, we'd be exhausted by the end of it. Like wow. it, it would almost be too much, but then they throw in a, you know, Shirley McLean throws in a one liner and then we're laughing unexpectedly and it changes the whole dynamic. It really does. It changes that melody of the scene. It's so true. That's a really good, really good observation. You, know, you, um, you can commit a hundred percent too to the slapsticky stuff. Uh, uh, Holly yes. Hunter, my two favorites in this are actresses are Holly Hunter and Diane Keaton. They have a way of losing their minds that is absolutely jaw dropping <laughs> and hysterical at the same time where, you know, I can't remember the movie that I think it was uh, raising Arizona where Holly Hunter's like, I love him so much. I love him so much. You go get me that baby high. You know, she's very like, committed to it 100%. and it's the funniest scene and she's bawling in the car. Yes. It's so true. Um, I just watched First Wives Club. It was on TV and so I had it playing and I I again I was reminded how great their comedy is the three of them together in that. And here they are dealing with very heavy subjects but you know there there's just so much levity in there and and just great timing. It's I really I think that's probably the biggest thing in my opinion that's missing from our faith Yes. Faith oriented scripts is that we're afraid to write in comedy for fear, exactly what you said, for fear that we're somehow going to trivialize or be perceived that we're trivializing whatever the topic is or the spiritual spirituality of it. Somehow we're not being reverent enough. Right. I think the fix to that is pretty simple. Um, as long as the material is not mocking Christ or mocking the Bible, as long as that laughter, that hilarity, that zaniness, that ridiculousness is put on us, the people, and we are yes. as ridiculous and we all are, you know, full of faults and we should be able to laugh at that. That is, that is our humanity. Yes. So yes. I feel that if we put the comedy on our ridiculousness, then that just solves that problem. I've never understood. In fact, I'm here to make sure that that changes because yes. there needs to be some really good Christian and faith-based comedies. Yes, there does. And we need you guys to to write them and to I know there cuz I know there many of you on here are writers, actor writers. Um and it does. It just gives them dimension and it it makes them human. I think someone's comment on here was that it, it, it makes them human. That's who we are. We're dimensional. We aren't drama all the time. And we also aren't comedy all the time. So, right. you know, some of the best comedies are those that also have those moments where we do go deeper mm -hmm. and we do understand the characters on a deeper level, not just, you know, up here doing pratfalls, but that right. they take us into <laughs> a deeper levels of those people, you know, and make them human. Um, be comedy with heart is I think. What yes. It's about. Yes, and absolutely. You, and it's the, it's the most powerful package. So I don't understand why they don't do it more. It's the most powerful package because when you can 
have someone kind of release their inhibitions by laughing and really yes. you, laugh, you laugh down in your belly. I mean, you're reaching where your emotions are down deep. You've already got them primed to make them cry. Like they're ready for it. You can break yes. heart after you make them laugh. You just get in there. <laughs> <laughs> Sam Benson asked, have you ever thought about writing a feature? Yes, I might be working on one now. I wondered. I thought that might be a little something you can't talk about, but you know. <laughs> um, I haven't done it yet, but I'm in the process. I'm outlining and going through a structure. I've got two stories that I really think are, are really good. I need to pick one and focus on it and get it done. Yeah, one at a time. Otherwise, neither get done, right? Right. So you just focus. Um, Emily Buckner is asking, what do you envision for comedy and faith-based films in this new chapter of film creators? So it's kind of what you just said, I think. Yeah. Um, I don't understand the part of new chapter of film creators. What does she mean by that? I uh, Probably just the next oh, the generation. Oh, the next generation. People coming up. Okay. I, I think that uh, it's essential. And here's why I think it's essential that we do this. Um, whenever there are war times in our past and our history, the two areas of film that thrive, even during the Great Depression, people would take what little money they have and rather than spend it on food, they go to the movie theater. Mm -hmm. because they would need to have hope and, and they would need something to be uplifting. And so they would yes. spend their money on comedies and musicals. Yes. So we are seeing a lot of war around us, a lot of division around us, mm -hmm. a lot of sorrow, confusion, um, evil. And so I think we're going to have to laugh at this point. I mean, I, mean, yes. I know that, I know that, that Christian filmmakers and companies are nervous to laugh. Right. Um, but I think that there's going to be, a, there's going to be a lot of success in it. You know, it was interesting because um, having spent much of my career in the faith-based world, I've had more tears shed in my audition rooms. <laughs> it's just wow. the nature of the beast. So when I was brought on to do Mom's Night Out, oh my gosh, it was just such a lifting, you know, and it was so fun to have these characters laughing and some physical comedy and, but still poignant. There's a scene where Trace Adkins is sitting in the outside the, in the lobby of the police station, you know, and he delivers the salvation message to Sarah Drew right there. And, and it's this great intimate moment where the rest of the movie is, you know, a little bit more broad. And I just remember what it felt like to work on it as just my, my soul craved to laugh, you know, after all of the intense drama. And, um, but what's interesting is that it didn't do as well commercially as they hoped it would, it which was an indication. Well theatrically. Theatrically. You're right. It has been doing well after, right? But when people are at home and they want to watch a faith-based movie, are you going to watch another heartbreaker? Or are you going to watch the one that makes you laugh? Well, the return on investment is showing that they want to make the one that makes you laugh. You're right. That's a really good observation. You're absolutely right. It it didn't do theatrically what they had hoped, which, which like you said, the the faith audience is kind of fickle. I think very that fickle. we're <laughs> very surprised and disappointed in that. Yeah, it's it's. I think all of us who are in in faith based filming filmmaking are a little like, huh? Okay, I'm not quite sure what I'm supposed to do. Um, but you're right. Streaming has changed the game because bringing back Christmas, I, it'll have a life from now on forever and be a classic, right? Yeah. A Christmas classic every year. It'll have that life, um, which is amazing. And that, that provides other potential streams of revenue other than just the theatrical release. But it just was interesting. That was the first time they had done a faith-based comedy released it theatrically and then to have the audience not really know what to do with it then um was a little head scratching because you would think it would have been a, a natural but uh like you said when you're at home theatrical situation with christians uh, with a christian film audience is um you know we need to support one another everybody here knows that i'm, I'm preaching right there 
I, I was in a Bible study group and they were like, oh, I'm so glad that you're doing this movie family camp. This is so great. You know, um, we're so tired of all the trash that's on. It's nothing but evil, satanic, demonic porn. You know, they <laughs> threw out the buzzwords. They threw them out. Right. Yes. And yet when it came to going, two people from my Bible study group of like 20 women went too. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? I don't, I, I think that's one of the things that COVID did do. Like, I don't think we've fully returned to our theatrical habits because the streaming platforms got so good and the TVs got so good and the, you know, the sound got so good that it does kind of take a lot more to get people to go to a theater, which I think is why movies like Sound of Freedom and other like purpose-driven war cry kind of rally yes. rally around movies do well because yeah. that's what will get people out of their seats. Um, so, uh, you know, hopefully that'll change, but um, we'll see. It's just interesting. The faith audience with regards to comedy is, is a bit confusing. <laughs> I think my goal would be what I want to see, my hope, my prayer for this industry is that we make really great movies to yeah. where whether you're it's where it's not labeled a Christian movie, even though that's the subject, where it's just a great movie and people who are Christian and of the secular world want right. to see it because it's just a great movie. A great movie. It yeah. Really will raise the bar. And I think sometimes that may be one of the mistakes in our industry is that we so want to uh, make movie by committee of like, oh, well, this one religion might be offended by this. And these old, this older ladies that won't go to the, they, they're going to be very offended by this. Oh, but right. the young want this. And so you water down what could be a really rich, uh, flavorful project. You water it down. And I think yes. we just focus on making really great content and trust that the audience will come. Yeah. And that includes comedy because secularly comedies do very well. Mm -hmm. So um, it it is a matter of there really shouldn't be a distinction a distinction in quality between secular comedy and faith comedy any of that it should all just be good comedy and people know good comedy you know they they know the timing of it they know the the um, ingenuity of it or the wit of it you know it's it that part's universal. Regardless of the content, for I sure. Um, John Man Marcuso asks, it seems like comedians make an easier transition to drama than vice versa. Seems like it's much more difficult for dramatic character actors to make the move to comedy. Feedback on this, please. Yeah. Uh, do, can I be myself? or, do, or Please. Or should I be no, please be yourself. Because a lot of dramatic actors can't do comedy. They're just not funny. I agree. They're, they're not. Mm -hmm. And they get cast to do comedy. And it's, it's cringy. It's, it's, and this happens for them. It hurts yeah. my heart. Cause it's, and that has happened in the faith space. Cause we have some actors who have become, you know, sort of well-known and have audiences. Um, and so it's like, okay, let's put them in our movie because they bring an audience, but they're not meant for comedy. <laughs> So yeah. Yeah. it doesn't work. Comedian into a dramatic role and, and they're not going to skip a beat. Yeah. But you take someone who doesn't know comedy. It's very specific. Um, yeah. But sometimes you don't need to know comedy. Sometimes they're just a funnier person and they can bring yes. to it and levity to it. Yes. Sometimes the part is written so funny on the page that if you just show up and commit to it, you're golden. Yeah, where you're in trouble as a dramatic actor who doesn't know how to be funny, and and isn't naturally funny. Where you're in trouble is if the material isn't funny and they want it to be funny. That's where you're in yes. trouble. Yes, they're not absolutely doing any favors at that point, and you don't have a bag of tricks to reach into to make it funny. Right. Yeah, and you can't. It's not something you can just force. You 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 yeah. know you can't make can't make something funny. Yeah. Um, so, and you think of some of those, you know, the, the, um, why, or like Jim Carrey's and the, um, Robin Williams. Thank you. I, all I could think of was Mork, his <laughs> Mork from Mork. <laughs> yeah. they, they're all too young. Nobody gets it. Does anybody get this? I know. <laughs> 
it's so true. Um, but yes, those, because they just portrayed humanity and they happen to be funny people with, yeah. you know, great wits themselves just as people. And so, um, to bring Emily Mork, <laughs> I love it. Lucille Ball, right? Yeah. See, that was a whole different kind of comedy that, the. I love Lucy kind yeah. of world. And that, that I'm glad she brought that up because the area of comedy that's really not been explored at all. And, you know, Chosen has already broken the ground as far as television series and kind of opened a door. We need to get some shows out there, some television series. Like we need to get, we need a sitcom people. Yes. A comedy. We need a half hour comedy, whether it's single cam or sitcom multicam we need to fall in love with a family or watch people kind of like, but you build a relationship with good luck, Charlie. We did a hundred episodes. They built a relationship with us with, for, we did it for over five years because I was pregnant, right. but over five years, you know, they build a relationship with us and you get to know these people and that you can't really get that as much in a movie. Right. Right. Um, so there was just a question up on the screen. Is there a difference between doing comedy for a sitcom and for a feature? Uh, yes. Uh, and no, yes and no. <laughs> is it just the technical side of it? Cause sitcom is typically multi-camera, right? Or Multi often. Yeah, usually, unless it's a single camera comedy and then you would do more of the same that you would for a film, but it's really like a stage play is how it's shot. And you learn to feel your camera, but you also learn to stay open so you don't block other people. As we're in a camera, you, you know, in a single camera world, you can face at each other and then they'll get a close up angle over here and then one over here. So the angles are different. You don't have to push as hard when you're getting this major close up. Uh, the stakes in a comedy and half hour of the comedy is so prevalent. The stakes are really high usually. Mm, yeah. uh, so you can kind of go for it more. Um, but interestingly enough, in Bringing Back Christmas, I think that's one of the most broad comedic roles that I've played. But, mm -hmm. you know, I wasn't playing just your average person. I was playing an angel, right? Right. So I had right. some liberty there. Yes, yes. And so um, how was it working with Mark Christopher Lawrence is a great comedic actor. Very funny. If you know, if you um, followed the show Chuck um years ago it was years ago but he was a great character in there you know just brought the funny when it was needed and um created a very unique presence in there um so how how was it working with you and mark two comedians okay so i mark and i are like <laughs> we're love bugs we are officially joined at the hip we want to do every movie together but i will tell you mark also has that real gift and ability to make you laugh and break your heart in a turn. Mm. Uh, yeah. And I know this standing across from him acting and being in a scene with him that he's so sweet that he just mm. breaks your heart. But at the same time, he's really hilarious. He really walks that line really well of, of bridging both of those worlds. He does it beautifully and, and, and effortlessly. Well, because you knew you were working across from a fellow comedian who gets comedy and is mm -hmm. so good at it, were you guys able to to play a little more? Were you able to kind yeah. of riff off each other? We were able to play more, riff off each other. And if you notice, like if in in family camp, I'll, I'll give you this example. Tommy was the one, they were the funny guys. It was very right. hard for me to pass that throne along to them, but they were they were the funny guys. I had to pass the torch. <laughs> Um, and I, that was not my job to be the funny guy. I could bring some levity, but I right. needed to really be grounding for him to be crazy. You can't have two crazy couples. Right. And so Mark did that for me and bringing back Christmas. He really rolled this realistic line and I was able to kind of spin out of control a little bit. Yes. Um, so that's what made that work. You can't have two people losing their mind or two people being low down. You really, it just doesn't make it as rich. You need the salty and the sweet. Yeah. That's a really good thing though, to to reiterate with our group here, which is be a gracious actor and be willing to release that sometimes. Understand the bigger purpose of the scene or the film, the message, whatever it is, and do whatever needs to be done in service of that, even if it means you don't get to be the one who gets all the big laughs. Yeah. Uh, no, if your number one priority should always be the movie. 
the script. Yes. If whatever project, that project needs to be number one. And you need yes. to make whatever choices that are going to be appropriate, bringing your A game, but not focusing on your A game because the show yes. is your A game, right? It has a title of its own and that is what you are there to work together with everyone. So you really have to know your place in it. Yeah. It's, you know, if, if um, I've seen improv, like improv troops that you'll go and you'll walk, you know, comedy sports or IO or whatever. Um, and it happens often when it's newer improv actors where they want to get the big laugh. So rather than serving the momentum of where the group as a whole is going, they want to land the big laugh and then it ends up shutting down the scene. Yes. And doesn't give anyone else a place to go and it actually kills it. You yes. know, they get their two seconds of glory, but the whole scene and every other actor is like dead in the water. Wow. Um, so it's really understanding that. And it isn't about you. It, it yeah. isn't about you getting every joke and landing all the big ones. It's about serving what needs to be accomplished. And the biggest the tip that I can give you to um, kind of make that happen is when you're in the scenes, really focus on, you know, as an actor, you talk and listen. Like I, I, the biggest compliment I've ever gotten as an actress is when editors say to me, thank you. You always give me something to cut to because mm. I'm always listening. There are, look, even with language, with all of us as human beings, there's two types of language. There's speech and then there's receptive language. Okay. Mm. So you have to be able to connect with those actors on a really human level in your character. Yes. And then the rest, if you do that as your number one priority, everything else falls into place. Yeah, yeah. Have you guys ever had a conversation where you just, there's a person, whether it's just two people or it's a big group, but there's someone who's actually not listening. They're just looking for the next opportunity to land a joke. They're just waiting to like, Oh, that's funny. Let me land this joke rather than engaging in the actual conversation. And it ends up actually being distracting. And like you said, sort of cringy, you yes. know, um, like waiting so, for your part to like throw in your part. You <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. And that goes for auditions too. You guys, we, when we're talking about the audition process, um, it, it purposely like trying to land the joke and, um, being funny for funny's sake isn't effective. Just be the character, understand the character, understand why that dialogue is funny and what makes that character and the circumstances humorous and play that, play it with all seriousness, you know, um, as opposed to- with, You're right on point. It's the same thing with drama as it is in comedy, which is you play, like, what are your intentions? What's your objective? Where have you come from? Where are you going? You focus yes. on that. Who am I talking with? with? Where are we going in this situation? And then everything else will kind, kind of falls into place. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I'm getting the message from Diego that it's time to wrap it up, which <gasps> makes me so sad because I literally could sit and talk to you like all night. Cause I, what we didn't get into was how you started and your training and your path. So we'll have to do that next time. I would love when, that. When you are, um, you have some time and we're able to do, cause man, we could just chat. It's a wealth of knowledge and experience and insight. So uh, plus you're just really awesome. So. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, just as a big group and I'm glad for, uh, there's so many people on here again, who it's like, yeah, we grew up with you. My kids grew up with you. So you did, there's just so much love for you here. Awesome. And um, so just know you are greatly loved and greatly appreciated. And I love what I love your heart. I love that you've entered into this space um, with such high caliber expectations because that's only going to raise all of us. And I love that you're adding your voice to the creative process in writing and whatever else you may be doing. Um, so yeah, just, we, we love you. We appreciate you. I love you. I love and, you. Thank you. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, we'll figure out a time to do this again and talk some more until Perfect. then. Big kisses to you and Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas! Yay! Yay! <laughs>
<laughs> okay, you guys, isn't she just the best? Like literally just the best. Um, so, uh, yeah. Okay. So we'll definitely have another time to spend with Lee Allen. Um, until then I love you guys and I'll see you next Tuesday. Love you. Bye.